Let's uh, read the Bible for just a moment together. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 11, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be preaching here in the next few chapters uh, for the next little while here out of these, these texts here. Uh, the Bible says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 11 that the people had uh, desired a king. They were tired of the ages of the judges, and they wanted a king. And uh, the, the Bible says in uh, verse number 15 of 1 Samuel chapter number 15, And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. And so you see there that this was, uh, in their mind, this was a happy thing. And uh, God allowed it, although it was not the perfect will of God. God allowed it to be so because uh, that's what they wanted. And by the way, one of the things that scares me about God is that God will give you what you want even if it's not good for you. And uh, so we ought to desire and leave the choice with God. Let God have His way in our life in all things and all matters and all areas. But something I see in the life of Saul that I want to focus in on tonight is that Saul was anointed king and God allowed him to be king of the nation. But if you go over into chapter number 13 and verse number 14, I see something that is completely different. I'm not really sure on the time difference, maybe just a few years here, difference between these two verses. But in verse number 14 of 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible says this. This is Samuel speaking to Saul. He says, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You find that Saul started off well, and I think he meant well, and I I think he had every intention of doing the right thing with his life. But you find out later on in his life, not very far down the road, uh, his kingdom is being stripped from him, and God is taking his kingdom away from him. And although he's fired here, he's not, he doesn't actually lose his kingdom until later on. And I want to preach on the subject tonight, the road to ruin. The road to ruin. And I want to pray and ask God's blessing on this service tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you for the opportunity to preach to this crowd here tonight. Thank you for the wonderful, sweet presence of God we've already felt and sensed in this place. And God, I do pray that you'd meet with us in this service. God, that you'd touch us. Lord, that you'd give me discernment as I preach. That you'd lead me and guide me as I preach. Lord, as I as I try to give what the, the thoughts that you've put upon my heart tonight, I pray that you would uh, please guide me. Please help me to say everything you want me to say, and please help me to avoid the things that you don't want me to say. And God, as I preach tonight, give me the heart of the people. Give me favor with the people. Give me the attention of the people. And Lord, I pray as we preach that uh, that you would uh, speak to the hearts of those here tonight. Lord, there's so many people who have such good potential for God, uh, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to uh, do everything we're supposed to do and heed this message, heed this warning in the Word of God tonight. As I preach, Lord, I pray that you'd help my mind to think clearly and help my mouth to speak clearly. We do pray for a good delivery of truth tonight. And as we give an invitation here in a little while, may people come to an old-fashioned altar, uh, weeping and seeking God's face. Uh, Lord, may there be an outward show tonight of, of an inward working in our hearts. Please help us to see that. Please help us to know that. And God, do a great work in our hearts and lives. Lord, we understand that all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. Lord, I pray as Moses prayed, I, won't, I, I don't want to go without you. I don't want to preach without you. I don't want to be in church tonight without God. Please show up in our midst. Please manifest yourself. Please do a work in our hearts and lives. And we'll thank you and praise you uh, for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, baby. Seated tonight. I uh, see here that King Saul in chapter 11, that he was anointed king over Israel and uh, God allowed it and it was a happy, joyful thing. Uh, But I see that later on in his life that he was actually stripped of his kingdom. He had actually disqualified himself. He had sinned against God. And can I say that I see so many Christian people today doing something very similar to this. Uh, You get saved and you get in church and everything's glory for a little while and everything's going good. But after a while, things start to slowly change. People start to backslide uh, and people 
people start to make choices that are contrary to the will of God and people start to mess up their life. And can I tell you, I fear messing up my life more than I fear anything else in the world. I would hate to displease God and I would hate to ruin my life and ruin my effectiveness and my service for Christ uh, by, by my sin. I, matter of fact, I was reading in the book of Jeremiah not too long ago and God uh, told, uh, God spoke to the nation of Israel through the prophet of Jeremiah saying, your sins have withheld good things from you. And can I tell you, I don't want to be that kind of Christian. I don't want to be robbed of the joy of the Christian life and be robbed of the, of the blessings of God in my life uh, because of my own personal sin. And, and, and the problem with Saul is that Saul was his own worst enemy. Uh, Saul's demise was self-inflicted wounds. And I see so many, especially preachers doing this today in America, I see so many preachers messing up. Uh, men that were good preachers, that were great preachers, that could stand in the pulpit and out-preach any preacher you've ever heard uh, in your entire life. Great men of God, great pulpiteers with the Spirit of God upon their life. And today you can't even find them anymore. Uh, they're out of the ministry. They're off selling Amway somewhere, working on a car lot. Uh, it just, just, I mean, they have disqualified themselves and messed up their life. And uh, I see lay people doing that too. Matter of fact, uh, the man who led me to Christ, Brother David Guerin, uh, the youth pastor at my church, is not even in church today. Uh, he messed up. He started, he started, he started doing things he never should have done. Started dabbling things he never should have dabbled in. And today, he's not even in church. He's not, he's out of the ministry. Not even in church. He's he's a drug addict down in Georgia today. And that was my youth pastor, my friend. And uh, if that'll happen to the man who led me to Christ, and that'll happen to David Guerin, one of the most godly youth pastors I've ever known in my entire life, then let it be known that that can happen to you and that can happen to me, my friend. Can I tell you, greater Christians than you and I have fallen in this life that you and I live. And can I tell you, that scares me. Matter of fact, one of the things that I notice in the New Testament, the New Testament, get this, the New Testament tells you to resist the devil but it tells you to flee youthful lust. Meaning this, that there's some things you better just stay away from. There's some things that you can't handle. It's, there's some things that you better just stay away from. And can I, I want to give you three points tonight because I'm a Baptist preacher and that's what we do. We give three points and they're alliterated. Who wrote that rule that you got to do it that way? I don't know, but that's just how it works and I don't know, but that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to give three points and then, uh, and then afterwards we're going to go out to eat because I haven't eaten uh, dinner yet. So praise God. Uh, I always preach shorter when I'm hungry. I don't know why that is, but I just do that. Amen. So you pray for me. And uh, I want to preach tonight on the road to ruin, uh, Saul's, uh, the road to ruin. Ruin. The first thing that I see that brought uh, Saul down the road of ruin was, uh, number one, I would call this, number one, Saul allowed disorder in his life. Disorder in his life. Uh, look what it says there in uh, chapter number 13. We're looking there in verse number one. The Bible says, And Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, uh, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 uh, were with his, uh, Saul in Michmash in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with uh, Jonathan in Gibeah of uh, Benjamin, and the rest of the people, he sent every man to his tent. And uh, so you see here that Saul is preparing for battle, and he's in a place called Gilgal. Look in verse number 5. The Bible says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand uh, which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward uh, from Beth, Beth Haven. And uh, the Bible says in verse number 7, And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan uh, to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet and Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So basically, uh, Saul is doing what he's supposed to do. He's trying to go war with the Philistines. And by the way, I'm against the Philistines. I love what, reading the Old Testament, watching these Israeli men uh, beat up these Philistines and go to war with these Philistines. Let me just say real quick, just for the sake of saying it, that the Bible is cooler than any Hollywood action movie ever put out. Amen. Glory to God. If you like, if you're like me and you like action and you're not, I mean, I'm easily bored. I got to have things going on and I like the Bible because the Bible is the coolest book ever written. Praise God. Arnold Schwarzenegger ain't got nothing on the Bible. Hallelujah to God. And so Saul is getting ready to uh, go to war with the Philistines, but he understands something. He says, I'm not going to go to war unless we have sacrificed unto the Lord. And that's a good thing. That's the right thing. I would not go to war without God's blessings on me. And uh, by the way, you better not go to war and tempt things for God without God's blessing and God's sanction on you. And uh, But he had a problem. He could not offer the sacrifice. That was Samuel's job. 
Samuel was the pro- well, he was the prophet and he was the priest. He was doing a dual office in these days, and uh, and that was Samuel's job to offer the sacrifice unto the Lord. Uh, but the problem was is that Samuel was a circuit riding preacher. He he went from place to place to place offering sacrifice everywhere he went, and he was ready. And Saul was ready to go to battle, but Samuel had not showed up yet. And he was worried about that. He said, I'm ready to go. And it, I mean, we got, we got our gear on. We got our helmet on. I mean, we've got our knee pads on. We've got our sword sharpened. We've got our spears ready to go. And uh, the Philistines are just right over that hill. Uh, but Samuel has not showed up yet. And what do I do? Look what it says in verse number 8. The Bible says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Uh, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So basically, he's getting ready to go to war. He's got everybody there, and he's waiting and waiting and waiting for Samuel to show up and he's just waiting and waiting and waiting and Samuel doesn't show up and in Saul's mind he's thinking if I don't go ahead and offer this sacrifice all these people are going to go home and I'm going to be fighting these Philistines by myself and I certainly do not want to do that so guess what he does? Verse number 9 the Bible says and Saul said bring me hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings the Bible says and he offered the burnt offering meaning that he brought disorder into his life. He was not allowed, according to the laws of God, he was not allowed to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord that was outside the will of God, that was outside the bounds that God had ordained. The verse number 10, it says, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Boy, you want to talk about ironic. He offered the offering before God, and uh, as soon as he was done, Samuel showed up. Uh, look what it says. Behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Amen. Uh, verse number 11 says this, and, Saul, and Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, uh, that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore I said, The Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord, I forced myself thereof, uh, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which He commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Uh, can I tell you that, Sa- that Samuel was not allowed to offer the sacrifice, and because of that, he brought disorder in his life. And can I tell you that everybody here today, if you get out of order with God's way in your life, then you will ruin your life. The road to ruin always starts when people get out of order with the God-given authorities and the God-given ways that God has ordained for you to obey. And if you disobey that, you have set yourself down the road to ruin. Amen. Uh, can I tell you that uh, we don't live in the Old Testament day. We don't live in the day of sacrifice. We live in the church age. And can I tell you that the divine order of the place that God has given you uh, to be right with God is in something called the local New Testament Baptist church, my friend. Someone asked me not too long ago, said, can you be right with God and be outside the local New Testament church? And I said, no way whatsoever, my friend. Can I tell you, the road to ruin starts when you get out of order with the God-given authorities that God has placed in your life, namely the church, the ground and pillar and ground of the truth. And if you get out of sorts with the church, you have brought disorder into your life, my dear friend. Uh, Can I tell you that God has ordained an institution called the church, and if you get out of sorts with that, you're out of the will of God. Amen. Let me say a few things about the local church that we need to have in order in our life. Can I say, number one, uh, that the local church, we need to be have order in its polity. Amen. Uh, Can I tell you that God did not call a board of deacons to run a church? God did not call a bunch of trustees to run a church. God did not call a bunch of women that are hyper-opinionated about every little tiny little thing to run a church. Amen. Uh, Can I tell you that God has called somebody called a pastor to run a church and God did not call you to run a church and if I see so many ministries get out of sorts with this kind of stuff and they think that well you know I know better than that preacher and I know better than that if you're so smart why didn't God call you to be the pastor of the church amen I'm stepping on toes. Are we okay tonight? Some of you got real upset when I said that. That's okay. Let me tell you, praise God. God has ordained the polity of the church to be run by a pastor, thank God. 
The Bible says in the verse uh, Hebrews chapter number 13, it says that obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. That's the local New Testament pastor. Amen. Can I tell you what I see? I'm just going to preach what's on my heart. Is everybody okay tonight? Uh, what I find to be funny and what I find to be ironic is that there's men out there that they will submit to a vocational authority. They will submit to a family authority. That, that, that you'll submit to what that woman wants. And they'll submit to the government. They don't want a speeding ticket, so they drive the speed limit. At least I hope you do. Amen. And, uh, and they'll submit to a, a government authority, a vocational authority, and a family authority. But most people that I know today have no spiritual authority in their life. And that's when the road to ruin starts. Can I tell you that you need a spiritual authority in your life and you need that. And if you don't have that in your life, you are living out of order of what God has called you to live by. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you something? I want you to hear me with your heart. There's a difference between allowing a man to preach to you every Sunday and allowing a man to pastor you week in and week out. I'm going to say that again because some of y'all didn't get that and I like that. Amen. Praise God. For some reason, I like it when, when, when people get real nervous when I preach. It makes me feel powerful. Amen. I love it. There's a difference between allowing a man to preach to you every Sunday and allowing a man to pastor your life. Can I ask you a question? Does anybody have any veto power over you? Well, I, are we all right? Is everybody okay? Y'all are making me nervous. I might have to go start the car early. We might end this revival tonight. Amen. Uh, can I tell you that, uh, that somebody's got to have a spiritual authority over your life, and if you don't have that, my dear friend, then you are living in a life of disorder, and can I tell you, it shouldn't be that way. You're going down the road to ruin. Can I tell you, I was in a situation in Missouri where there was a, there was a, a friend of mine. He was going to go to Kenya with me one year, and, uh, and he, he had to back out of the trip, and, and we didn't really know why. His pastor and him were going to go to uh, Kenya with me, and, uh, and, and it was just the whole kind of trip just fell apart with as far as this one guy in particular. And, uh, and he, he just said, I can't go. I got things going on. And uh, he, he, man, he just, he started, him and his wife started missing church here and there, and uh, they, the pastor would call them and see how they're doing. They never would answer the pastor's phone calls. Uh, by the way, that's a, that's a bad sign. Amen. What are you, what are you hiding from? Why, 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 what's all this secret business everybody's doing? I mean, why are, why are you diving behind shelves at Walmart when you see the preacher? What's wrong with you? That happens a lot to a lot of preachers. That's a pretty common thing. I mean, look, listen, I, I, see, I see women, I mean, walking around Walmart and they see me, they run. I don't know why. I didn't know I was that ugly. Amen. What you got to hide, lady? Were you all right? I, I don't know. What am I preaching about? Oh, yeah, that guy, that guy. And uh, they started avoiding the preacher, started sh stopped showing up to church, and they, they stopped uh, answering the preacher's phone calls. And uh, next thing you know, she started showing up to church about three months later. And he stopped showing up to church. And the funny thing, the sad thing was when he finally dug and 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 tried to pry information out of her, she finally admitted, said, Preacher, we're going through a divorce. And can I tell you that if they had just sat down with the preacher when they first started having problems, they probably could have prevented a lot of that kind of stuff. Can I tell you that God has given you a spiritual-minded person in your life? It's called a pastor. And if you don't use your pastor, my dear friend, you are headed down the road to ruin. Boy, you don't believe that, but I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. Can I tell you that churches are getting out of sorts with their polity? I would say also that churches are getting in disorder with their purpose. Can I tell you that God has not called the New Testament church to feed the world? We okay? God has not called the New Testament Fundamental Baptist Church to put shoes on every poor little African foot in Africa. I met, a guy in, I met a guy in Missouri not too long ago. He said, I have a shoe ministry called Blessed Are the Feet of Them That Preach the Gospel. And he, he said, that's what we do. We, just, we, we, we go around and collect everybody's old shoes and fill up old, a tractor trailer full of old shoes. I said, I bet that smells terrible, don't it? He goes, oh, yeah. And uh, he, he said, we just fill up old shoes from America. And what we do is we take that tractor trailer load and we take it over to Africa. And we, we take we, all those little boys and girls come. And we just throw shoes at them and give everybody shoes. And that's how, that's how we do God's work. I said, that ain't God's work. God's work is something called the gospel. Amen. Can I tell you, a lot of people out there today are doing, they're trying to make the world a better place from which to go to hell. 
And they're doing it. They're, they're, they're doing all kinds of good things. They're, they're curing diseases. They're feeding, feeding the hungry. And, and they're, they're putting shoes on poor little African kids' feet. And I'm not against all that kind of stuff. I wish all that was gone. I wish world hunger was, was eradicated. I mean, I've never been hungry a day in my life. Amen. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I would to God all that stuff was getting around. But can I tell you, God has not called the, per, the local New Testament church to do that kind of stuff. We're out of disorder with our purpose. Can I say that we're out of we're out of order with many different things? But I see disorder not only in the church, but I see disorder in a lot of homes. Can I tell you that God has called the man to run the home? Well, some of you got nervous on that one. Some of you men started looking at the floor when I said that. Amen. God has called the husband to run the home. And I see a lot of ladies running homes today in churches, and the reason they're running homes is not because they want to, it's because they have to. There's men that won't run a home. Can I tell you, the road to ruin starts with disorder, and lots of times the disorder starts in the home with the husband who won't lead. Amen. We got, we got husbands today who won't lead and wives today that won't submit. And can I, is everybody all right? We all right? All right. We got husbands that won't lead. We got wives that won't submit. And we got kids that, are, that have no idea what life's all about. They're so confused and bearing the consequences of all that kind of stuff. Can I tell you that God has called the husband to lead the home and God has called the wife to submit in that home and God has called the children to live in that kind of environment of love and structure and most kids don't have that and that's what's wrong with them. Amen. Can I tell you what I see in a lot of homes today? I, 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 you pray for me. Can I preach what's on my heart? All right. I need a vote of confidence. I'm real nervous right now. All right. Uh, amen. All right. Well, look, look, what I see today, I see a lot of men who are failing in their home. And these men are tough. These men could take me out in that parking lot and they could whoop me and murder me with their bare hands. But they're not man enough to tell their little girl, four-year-old little girl to sit down. We got guys today that they're so strong. I mean, they, they, could, they could punch me in the face and break, break every bone in my body and they're strong, but they're not man enough to go soul winning. We got men today that, man, you go to work and you work hard and you're smart and you're tough and you're, I mean, you're a rugged American man, but you're not man enough to lead your family. Can I tell you that that's what happens with a lot of homes today? The road to ruin starts with disorder, and there's disorder in churches, there's disorder in the home. And can I tell you that God's work has to be done God's way? And can I tell you that God's way for the home is for the man to lead, the wife to follow, not the other way around? And can I tell you, if you're out of order with that, you're going to bear the consequences of that kind of stuff. Some of you are nervous on me already, amen. And by the way, let me say that I, I'm, I'm nervous about most North American males today. Most North American males are, are too effeminate for my taste, amen. Used to be back in the World War II generation, if you called a man a liar, that was fighting ground right there. They would, they would fight over that kind of stuff. But can I tell you, we got, we got men today that, that somebody could come up and just, just say terrible things in your presence and terrible things in front of your wife and terrible things in front of your kid and you just act like, oh, that, that didn't happen. I, I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to rock the boat. I, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything. Oh, I just, let's just, let's just be, let's just be passive on this kind of stuff. Hogwash, amen. My wife gave me the biggest compliment I've ever had in my life one time. We was at a youth camp, junior camp, and I got up in junior camp and I preached. And I, I'm, I'm talking about, I preached one of the hardest messages I've ever preached in my life to juniors. Amen. I mean, we had, we had, six, we had uh, 10 year olds giving up all kinds of things. It was the most awesome experience of my life. Amen. And by the way, I like preaching to kids because kids don't get offended like adults do. Some of y'all don't like that. We, are we, we all right? Some of y'all making me nervous. Amen. All right, and I, I preached, and you know, one of the things was my, my wife, I preached against everything. I preached against, I mean, cigarettes, everything that 10 year olds are doing these days. And uh, I preached against all kinds of stuff. And my wife came to the altar and, and cried and went back and sat in her pew after the invitation. And I went to my wife, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, my wife's give up cigarettes. I didn't even know she smoked it this whole time. I mean, I said, what in the world is going on? My, my wife is. Give up her, her snuff. It, it, well, snuff wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but, uh, but, I mean, I think of what's going on. And uh, my wife gave me a big compliment. She said, I just went to the altar, and I said, thank you, Jesus, for letting me marry a man. And I, I'm talking about my head went like that. I said, yeah, buddy. You know it. Amen. But can I tell you, the reason she said that, she explained it to me later. She said, I, we get around a lot of other Christian couples, and that husband is so weak, won't lead, won't stand for nothing, 
won't, won't, won't stand for nothing. Won't stand for nothing. Got a lot of men that are doing that today. And can I say the road to ruin starts with this order? Let me give you another story real fast. Some of you aren't listening anymore. And uh, go with me over to chapter number 15. I want you to give you this, another story here where uh, Saul messes up again and Samuel has to go through the same thing with him over again here in chapter number 15 of uh, 1 first, first Samuel. We find here that uh, there's another battle going on. And, uh, and, and God uh, leads Samuel to tell Saul, said, I want you to go smote the Amalekites. In verse number 15, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter 15, verse number 1, uh, we talked about disorder, but I want to give you another thing here real fast. It says in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, And Samuel uh, also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Uh, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. And by the way, let me stop right there and say, you ain't going to get away with nothing. And these, these wicked world ain't going to get away with nothing either. It says in verse number three, God speaking and says to Saul, says, now go and smite Amalek. And notice these words carefully, look real careful. And utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So he says, go, go kill everything that's living. I want it all wiped off of this planet. I want it all gone. Look what it says in verse number 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until, the, until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And the Bible says this, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites. What's that word right there? What's that word, church? Alive, that's not God's will. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Look at this verse. This is look at this is amazing. He spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. The second step on the road to ruin, the first step was disorder. The second step on the road to ruin is disobedience. Can I tell you that uh, God, told San, God told Saul to kill everything, but Saul let some things live. The problem today is that we are busy killing the things that God said live and letting live the things that God said to put to death. Can I tell you that God said, I want it all dead. I want all the sheep. I want all the oxen. I want the camels dead. I want the men. I want the women. I want it all dead. Uh, but Saul said, well, now wait a minute here as he's going through and chopping and, and killing. He says, well, now wait a minute. That, that, look at that ox right there. That thing looks like a beautiful T-bone being in there. Praise God. Hey, look, I like steak. If you don't like steak, you're not a man. Amen. And he's looking at that thing and said, man, I bet you we could get a good loin out of that thing. Keep that thing alive for a little while. Let's just, let's see what's going on. And he goes through and, and there's sheep and he says, man, we could get, we could get some beautiful fur coats out of that sheep right there. Let, let's just let that one slide. It's okay. And, and little compromise by little compromise, small disobedience by small disobedience. I mean, come on. It's just a sheep. It's not that big. It's not that big a deal. You know, uh, just a, just a one ox here, one ox there. It's not that big a deal. I mean, come on. Surely these are good things that God would want us to enjoy. God would want us to have this because, you know, this is a nice, good thing. And this is, this isn't a bad thing. And little compromise after little compromise after little compromise. And he disobeyed God blatantly. Can I tell you that there are some things as Christians that we cannot have fellowship with? And let me just say this. Uh, look, look what it says in verse number 9. I want you to see this. This is something that's, that's very interesting. Uh, matter of fact, go to verse number 3. Let's compare, compare verse number 3 to verse number 9, okay? It says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, okay? Right there, God says, I, God has placed condemnation on all of them, okay? He says they're all wicked, they're all vile, I want it all gone. But look in verse number 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs. And notice these next words here. It says, and all that was good. God had declared it vile, but they had declared it good. And I think churches are doing that today. Churches are doing this with, with, with things called rock and roll. 
God has declared that vile, but now we can use that for the Lord. I mean, come on. It's got a good beat. We just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can praise God in Jesus' name. Can I tell you, God has declared it vile, and God has put condemnation on that kind of stuff, and we cannot declare it good what God has declared wicked. I've never seen such nonsense going on in America today. We got Christian everything. We got Christian nightclubs. We got, we got Christian rap stars. Are you crazy? Are you insane? I love Jesus. Yo, yo, yo. I love Jesus. Yo, yo, yo. That, that's kind of stuff out of hell is what that is. Don't you talk to me about no Christian rap. There ain't no such thing no more than about Christian rap than there is Christian liquor. And I'm against Christian liquor. You folks like Duck Dynasty, I'm against Christian liquor. I'm against Christian liquor. There ain't no such thing as Christian liquor. I'm against it. I'm against it. I'm against it. I'm against it, my friend. Amen. Ain't no such thing as Christian liquor no more than there is Christian cocaine. Ain't no such thing as Christian liquor. We got the Duck Dynasty wine collection. That's stupid. That's stupid. That's stupid. That's out of hell. That's an abomination unto God. I'm against it. And I thought I'd just let you know about it. Amen. Woo! This is good preaching even if I am the one doing it. Amen. Some of you are getting pale on me. Amen. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, matter of fact, hold your place here. I want to give you a New Testament verse just in case you think I'm being crazy and you think I'm just being some mean old Baptist preacher and being uh, rude-spirited and uh, whatever you want else you want to call it that you, you compromise and people call us Baptist preachers who like to take a stand and like to believe the Bible. Look what it says in Romans chapter number 13. Go there with me real fast. I want, to, I want you to see this. It says here in Romans chapter number uh, 13 and uh, verse number 14, the Bible says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Meaning this, that uh, you ought not provide any opportunity for the flesh. Meaning this, that there are some places you should not go. I said it. I said it. Used to be Christians preached against going to the bars. Used to be we preached against going to nightclubs, but now we got, we got youth groups that are trying to imitate that atmosphere so the people will come. Make no provision for the flesh. Look, go, matter of fact, I'll give you another one just, just, just to make your blood pressure go up just a little bit higher. Amen. Go with me to Colossians real fast. Colossians chapter number 3. I want you to see this uh, because uh, this is such wonderful, wonderful things. And by the way, if, if there's beer at a family gathering, you ought not even go. I said it. If there's rock and roll there, I, I'm bothered by it. I don't even, I, look, I don't like it. I don't like it. I, look, hey, amen. We all right? Is everybody okay? Some of y'all think I'm crazy, but that's all right. Colossians chapter 3. Let me give you some Bible just so you can take a breath and chill out a little bit. The Bible says in verse number 4 of Colossians 3, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. The Bible says in verse number 5, mortify. Ooh, that's a good word. You know what that word mortify means? It means put to death. It means slay the sheep. It means slay the oxen. It means kill what God said to kill. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Uh, oh boy, look, can I say this real fast? I get real, real, real worried about some of the things that I see going on in churches today. And I, I, get, I get real nervous around all this flirtatiousness that I see going on. It bothers me. Bothers me. I, I, it just bothers me. We live, we live in a selfie generation. Everybody's taking selfies of themselves. And makes me nervous. You, what's, what's wrong with you? You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to look pretty. Who are you trying to look pretty for, lady? Well, y'all didn't like that. Y'all are, y'all, okay. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, 
evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things cometh, uh, uh, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Look in verse number, uh, verse number eight. But now uh, ye also put off all these things: anger, wrath, malice, uh, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created him. Uh, can I tell you? That that I'm against things. I preach against sin and I love it. Thank God. The Bible spells it out for me. There's things as a Christian that if I'm going to be in obedience to God, I cannot have fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness. Amen. And just so you know, I'm an independent, fundamental, premillennial, King James only Bible believing, biscuit loving Baptist preacher and I'm against everything. Hallelujah. If you want to know what, if you want to question me about something, just go ahead and assume I'm against it. Amen. I'm against everything. I'm against cap teeth, chrome on cars. I'm against argyle socks. I'm against toupees. I'm against the color yellow. I'm against Barney the dinosaur. I'm against everything. Praise God. I love you. That God ain't within a million miles of that stuff. I love you. You love me. I'll shoot you with an M16. Amen. That's a wonderful. Pray. That's wicked. I'm against the Teletubbies. I'm, uh, sometimes when I'm at a church, I, I like, uh, sometimes if I'm in a place and I preach at a lot of new churches every year, sometimes if I'm in a place and I can't really tell where they are, I'll just get up and I'll say something crazy. I'll just say, I, well, no, not too crazy, but I'll just get up and I'll say, I think pink, my men that wear pink shorts are a little, little bit effeminate for me. Just to see what they react to. I was in California, and I was, I, I was in Sacramento, California, the land of fruit and nuts. Amen. Nothing good ever come out of California. Everybody out there is, a, everybody out there is like a skateboard dude. Like, that was a rad sermon, Brother Spencer. Amen. Glory to God. I can't stand that stuff. That bothers me. Makes me nervous. Amen. Acting like Tony Hawk Christians out there or some weird nonsense like that. And I got up in that church and I couldn't get them to budge. I couldn't get them to react. They wouldn't smile. They wouldn't laugh. They wouldn't say amen. And I just got up in the middle of my sermon trying to preach on Jesus being the Son of God and the Savior of the whole world. And I just said, I'm against men wearing pink shirts. Amen. And the whole congregation about looked at their pastor and they never heard nothing like that in their life. Amen. Glory to God. That was the best love offering I'd got in my life. Amen. Glory to God. But I'm against everything, thank God. And I think we ought to, there's some things as Christians, I think we ought to stand against certain things. And I think that uh, we ought to be against certain things. And there's certain things in our life that we just cannot allow to come into our lives. It will send us down the road to ruin because we are disobedient about the things in our lives that God doesn't want there, my friend. When I was, um, when I was in uh, Bible college, I told you that my youth pastor had, was, uh, had fell into sin. I started working at a, a, in Knoxville there, and my youth pastor came up there, and he got a job, wanted to try to advance his education there a little bit at the college. And uh, my youth pastor got into drugs and got out of church and uh, I remember my youth pastor called me one day. He had actually overdosed on drugs. I'm talking about my youth pastor, the, the, the man that God had used to lead me to Christ. He, got, he backslid real bad, got, in, got into drugs and got into all kinds of things. And one day I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee in Bible college. My own youth pastor calls me and says, Spencer, I'm up here at this place. I need you to come get me right now. And I dropped everything I was doing. I went to go get him. And he said, Spencer, he said, I, I, I took something and I don't know. It's, it's scaring me. It's bothering me. He said, I'm, I, I think I'm overdosed on something. I need you to take me the hospital, and I took my youth pastor to the hospital. I took my own youth pastor to the hospital because he overdosed on drugs. My own youth pastor. And they did a bunch of chemical things to him, put an IV in his arm and withdrew him from the reaction he was having. And my youth pastor sat there and he looked at me. He said, Spencer, you're probably wondering what happened to me. I said, yeah. What happened? He said, you used to be my hero. Now I'm standing here over your body watching you have an OD on something stupid. He said, Spencer, I'm going to tell you exactly how I got started. He said, one day I was working at the car lot, and I was trying my best to do right with, be right with God. I wanted to read my Bible. And he said, but one day I got into a car, and I was, he was a car salesman at a car lot. And he said, I got into the car, stuck the key in the ignition, turned the car on. And he said, that radio came on. And he said there was rap music on that radio. And he said, I had to make a decision. Was I going to turn that off and be right with God? 
or I was going to let my flesh be satisfied by this music. And he said, Spencer, I didn't turn it off. And he said, I would to God I could go back out and turn that music off. He said, I'm laying here in this place right now with drugs in my system because I chose not to turn that music off. That's the problem with some Christians today. It's just a little country music. It's not that bad. I mean, come on. They talk about Jesus. It's just a little Tim McGraw. And, uh, you know, it's not that big a deal. I mean, come on. It's not, it's not that big a deal. Come on, preacher. Don't you think you're being a little legalistic here? You, know, you, you feel so special throwing that word legalist around, don't you? You don't even know what that word means. Can I tell you what legalism is? Legalism is adding works unto salvation. Meaning this, that, that, that legalism is basically that Christ partially pays for your salvation and by good works you pay the rest of the balance off over the course of your life. That's legalism, okay? The Methodists are legalists, all right? The Catholic Church is legalism. The, the Church of Christ is legalism. A Baptist preacher that tells you you shouldn't have beer in your home is not a legalist. A Baptist preacher that tells you you need to throw away your country music CDs is not a legalist, amen. Can I tell you? I, look, if you watch that wicked filth on TV and I stand up and tell you you shouldn't be watching that, that's not legalism. That is a Bible preacher trying to help you stay away from sin and try to keep your family together and keep your kids from going crazy and losing their mind. I cannot tell you how many Baptist kids I see losing their mind and it all starts because somewhere, somehow they get a hold of something by, by looking on a computer or something stupid like that and get involved with music that they never should get involved with and it sends them down the road to ruin. Never does the devil tempt a man to do the wrong thing without giving him a good motive to do it. Think of all the more people you could reach if you just dropped your standards. Think of all the people, all the young people you could reach if you would just put a praise band up here. Think of all the great things you could do. That's satanic. It's the same trap that ruins Saul, and it's the same trap that's going to ruin churches across this country. I just want to say thank God I live in a, I, I'm at a church where I can preach like this and not get asked to leave. Amen. Amen. We all right? Is everybody okay? We all right? Good. The preacher said okay, and I guess I'm okay with that. Amen. Let me say this. Some of you, I lost some of you. I said that he was in, he, he, the road to ruin was brought by his disorder. His disobedience, let me give you this third of all, the road to ruin was brought by his own dishonesty. Look what it says. He messed up in verse number 9. Look in verse number 10. The Bible says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me. And by the way, some of you are there right now. And hath not performed my commandments. And it, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Well, Samuel was a man of God. He cried. He cried. He said, oh, God, this is Saul. I love Saul. I don't want him to mess up. God, would you, would you, Lord, that surely he didn't do that. Verse number 12 says this, And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. Behold, he set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. Verse 13 says this, And Samuel came to Saul... And Saul said unto him, talk about the man who just disobeyed God. Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou over the Lord. Notice this. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's not what he did. I meet a lot of people in church today. You think because your physical body comes to a building with a steeple on top of it. And you come and you sit in a service maybe once, twice, even three times a week. You think that you're right with God because you do that. Are we okay? Is everybody all right? You think that's all there is to it. Then you walk out the door and as soon as you crank up that ignition, bah, 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 all that comes on. And then you go home and you turn on that TV and you watch everything that the world watches. And you say the same things the world say. You laugh at the same jokes the world laughs at. And you do the same things that the world does. Can I tell you, we are not going to have revival until we get honest about how wicked we really are. I've done God's will with earrings and tattoos all over his body. And I, I've done the will of God and he's not there Sunday night. Oh, I'm doing the will of God. And they don't send their kids to camp ever. It's funny that these parents 
got enough money, these daddies especially, you got enough money to go deer hunting in the fall, but when it comes youth camp time, you're broke. Woo! Amen. When it comes time to go to that NASCAR rally down in Indianapolis, if they even have that thing anymore, you got all the money in the world to come down there and go to that thing. When it comes time, and it comes time for camp, well, I preach your words, it's just hard times right now. Hogwash, amen. You got enough money for that vacation, but you ain't got enough money for no camp. What is wrong with you, my dear friend? Dishonesty. Dishonesty. Are we all right? Some of y'all making me nervous. Let me say this. People that are right with God will acknowledge their sin, but people that are not right with God won't. Let me go with me. Hold your place there. Go with me to Psalm 51. I want you to see this. This is David's penitent prayer. This is the difference between Saul and David. When Saul did wrong, he wouldn't admit it. But when David did wrong, he'd admit it. Look in Psalm 51. I want you to see this. He says, uh, this is after he messes up with Bathsheba and all that whole thing. Um, he says this. He, he says in verse number 1 of Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Boy, that's where we're not at right there. He says, for I acknowledge, verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. Look in verse number 5, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. And he goes on and on. He says, verse 7, purge me. And he says, wash me. He says, verse 8, make me. He, he said in verse 9, hide my face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. What I'm trying to tell you today, church, is that people that are right with God will at least acknowledge where they're at. And people that are not right with God, boy, you get mad when anybody even implies that you're not right with God. I worked in, uh, when I was in Bible college, I worked at a place called Ingalls for a little while. Ingalls, which is a uh, southern grocery store. Amen. It was, a, it was a nice, clean grocery store that I worked at. And I worked with two girls that went to Bible college. They were a little bit weird. Most girls that went to Bible college were those days. And uh, one of them was godly. I'm talking about she floated everywhere she went. She was so godly. I mean, she just was, she loved the Bible. She loved Jesus. She, she was a little bit scary, but she loved Jesus and loved the Bible. And, uh, and, 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 and she was good. There's another girl I work with. I, I could have swore she's half demon possessed. Chinese little thing set her off. A girl in Bible college, hot temper. And, uh, and by the way, a, a girl can have a long, skort, a long skirt, but if she got a short temper, she's not spiritual. And I went to, I said, I'm going to do a social experiment today. Let's see how this goes. I'm always experimenting with people. And I went up to one of them. I went up to the one that was right with God. And I looked her right in her face and I said, you're a wicked devil. And I hope you get right with God. And you know what she said? She slumped over. She said, I know, pray for me. And I said, wow, that didn't go as I expected. Amen. Amen. And I went to the other one. Her name was Charity. Charity was wicked. Charity actually got kicked out of Bible college that, that semester, okay? Got sent home because she was immoral and wicked. And I went to Charity, and I said, Charity, let me talk to you. She said, what? I said, you're a wicked devil, and you need to get right with God. And she called me everything but a white man. I mean, she, how dare you say that about me? How dare you even imply that I'm not righteous before my God? I mean, just went on this crazy. It was, it was poetic, some of the things she said. It was wild, some of the things she said. But you know what I found out? I found out that people that are right with God will acknowledge that their sin, but people that are not right with God will not acknowledge their sin. Can I tell you that we're never going to get right unless we're willing to admit where we are, where we are. Uh, can, I, can I share an illustration? Some of you aren't listening anymore. Can I at least, let's have a vote of confidence. Give me five more minutes to preach. I'm going to put my watch on to give you hope. All right, raise your right hand if you give me at least five more minutes to preach, okay? Right, five more minutes, all right? All right, all right. Let's do this. I want to have a conversation with my friend, my friend, Brother Brian, back there in the back. Brother Brian, how you doing? Are you happy today? we got a baby coming soon. Brother Brian is excited about that. Brother Brian, how much weight have you lost recently? 65 pounds. Okay, very good. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Um, I've, I've lost a lot of weight too. I've lost close to 80 pounds. Amen. So I'm doing better than you. Amen. In your face. And, uh, so I'm going to talk to my friend, brother Brian. Y'all, y'all just, y'all just listen for a moment. Okay. You know, brother Brian, you, you know why I started losing weight? 
I was overweight for years. But you know what I'd do? I'd stand in front of that mirror and I'd go, and I'd suck it all in. And I'd look in that mirror and I'd say, I'm not that bad. And I'd go, see, I still got it. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not that bad. Yeah, I, I'm okay. I got a little while to go. And then I'd go to other places. I, I'd see folks. I said, well, when I'd see people that were really big. And I'd be like, I'm not like that guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, that guy, whoa. If they, if they had choir robes and they made a choir robe for him, they'd have to put cup holders in it. That's how big that guy is. And I mean, you know, I mean, the big guy singing that song, uh, singing that song, Love Lifted Me. And I'm thinking, no, love ain't lifting you, sir. Praise God. And, uh, you know, stuff like that. And then one day, I, Brother Brian, I, one day I looked in the mirror and I sat there and I thought, I'm fat. That hit me real hard because I didn't think I was fat. I thought I was all right, you know, Brother Brian. I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying. Y'all, y'all just listen. I'm talking to my friend, okay? So don't get mad at nothing I'm saying. I'm just talking to my friend. Y- y'all see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm talking to my friend, okay? You're eavesdropper. I'm talking to my friend, Okay. And Brother Brian, I looked in the mirror and I said, I'm fat. And I said, I need to do something about this. So I went and got on a treadmill, Brother Brian, because we're just talking, okay? I, I went and got on a treadmill and, and my goodness, it was like, it was terrible. I ran a mile in less than, I right at like 14 minutes. It was terrible. I mean, I, 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 I was hurt after I ran that mile. And I thought to myself, I have gotten in such bad shape and I have lost, I've lost close to 80 pounds, Brother Brian. But what, what I'm trying to say, Brother Brian, is that I would not have decided to start losing weight had I not realized that I needed to. Okay? And Brother Brian, what I'm trying to say is, is that people in churches today don't want revival because they don't think that they've done anything wrong. Brother Brian, how you doing back there? We okay? What happens is, is that people in churches today don't think we need revival because we think we're okay. We're like the church at Laodicea. We're blind and naked and crazy. I mean, just in terrible shape, but we don't even know it. That's what happens to a lot of churches today. And I think if we would just be honest, by the way, there's more hope for an honest person than there is for a person who has no lie, who, who lies about their sin. Go back to First Samuel chapter fifteen. We're going to end here real fast. I told you I was going to take. Or I, was, I told you I was going to be done here. Let me just read a few more verses and we'll be done. I'm a Baptist preacher. That's how we we lie about this kind of stuff. Verse thirteen says this. He said, "I have performed the commandment of the Lord." Look in verse number fourteen, and Samuel said, "What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear?" Can I tell you, there's a lot of bleeding sheep in our churches today. We live in a country that we've basically lost. People are all around this church dying and going to hell, and what are we even doing? We've got Baptist churches that are deader than four o'clock in the morning, and, but we sit there and we're okay, we're good, we're still holding the line, dear brother. <laughs> and we haven't passed out of gospel tracts in a coon's age. Shouldn't be that way. The road to ruin starts with disorder, disobedience, and dishonesty. But I think if we would just be honest, I think there'd be hope for us. I think what needs to happen tonight, I'm going to close my Bible, what needs to happen tonight is we need daddies to get on the altar and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm I'm messing up my family. We need Christians to get on the altar tonight and say, Lord, forgive me, I don't love my Bible like I should. Lord, forgive me, I've allowed things, I've entertained things in my mind that I never should have entertained. Lord, please forgive me, please cleanse me. Let's all stand tonight and we can have somebody play that piano. I think that'd be God's will for us to do that tonight.